Okay, uh, welcome to uh, PM Zagreb December meetup, Ooh, the last one of the year. So we have with us uh, Damir Plage from Amodo, right? And he deals with international sales and things of that nature. So we're going to hopefully learn how to better communicate with an international audience. Oh, Come on. Uh, yeah, thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm in Nomoto responsible. I'm actually heading the business development. So it's a bit broader space than the sales itself, but still uh, sales is a very important part of it. Uh, so idea here is uh, with this minimalist approach with, with the slides, to kind of open the discussion around several, several topics uh, that uh, anyone who, who is in sales will stumble upon sooner or later. So maybe to to, to spark the discussion that is going to take place later on in, uh, in the panel. So one of the things, uh, one of the first things that, uh, that I want to mention is actually communication. <laughs> Since we're mentioning communication, I think that uh, <laughs> it wasn't an intention, but it was a kind of mismatch between the announced uh, topic and <laughs> what I actually will present, uh, and that's part of the communication. Uh, but still, on a general level, um, uh, it's important to remember what actually communication is, what, what is the definition. I don't want to bother you with your own various definitions from various angles. But actually, we um, take for granted that uh, if the message is sent, whatever um, the media is, uh, the communication is made. But actually, this is this is not so uh, because there is no assurance that the other side uh, acknowledged, accepted, and re heard anything from what you said or what you want to, what, what message you wanted to transmit. Uh, so it is necessary for for the other part to reply uh, in order to uh, acknowledge you that uh, the message is received. Uh, but. There is still not the communication by definition, so it is needed for the sender of the message to uh, to acknowledge to to the other side that he also received a reply. Uh, this has to, you know, bear in mind all the time we are communicating with uh, prospects and clients, uh, because of, especially in this tech companies nowadays we rely on on various tools. We all we all communicate with, uh, you know course emails but also slack uh, chat messages and so on and so forth uh, through which we we think that we kind of uh, sent the message and we understood each other whereas later in the phase you you understand that the that the understanding wasn't uh, perfect uh, so to say so uh, I would advise anyone who who is involved directly uh, in communication not to rely 100% on a text uh, media and actually to force uh, meetings uh, via whatever, uh, via Skype, WebEx, uh, whatever is available that can send more messages that uh, enables you to, to see the expressions from the other side, to, to learn about their standings and to to enable you to understand them better. I will talk about it slightly later. Uh, <clears throat> so even though it's very convenient to text, to, to chat, to, to use whatever is available uh, 24 hours a day, uh, uh, my advice is to force old school phone calls, to, f to force even more if possible, old school face-to-face uh, -face meetings uh, if available, even the, even if the client or the prospect is not in a country. So from time to time, you should meet in the face. Okay. Mm. So in a sales process, uh, another topic that, that I want to put on the table is qualification, we call it qualification. Meaning, um, okay, those guys probably call us and uh, they might be interesting, be interested in something. But uh, the question is, are we interested in working with them? The thing is that uh, a lot of companies are looking uh, left and right for various solutions. And they're usually 
not aware of uh, all the consequences uh, of uh, such projects. B back in the day when I worked a lot uh, in e-commerce, you know, people just uh, send a piece of paper saying uh, we wanted to sh have a website, a you know web shop, and a, you know marketplace, and this and that. And what is the price? And of course, uh, from the very beginning, you see that uh, this probably will not fly because the person is not aware of the complexity and the cost involved. So, in order to structure this in a proper way, uh, uh, we usually have a certain questionnaire that we go through uh, on the first meeting. Uh, the, the goal of the questionnaire is to, to understand the prospect better and to qualify it. Is it something for us or is it not? So, part of it uh, are the questions uh, which um, might not be the ones that the client will or the prospect will answer, like uh, what is the budget involved, uh, what is the timeline, you know, who are the stakeholders, are you the one who is, uh, who is deciding uh, on the budget, uh, on the vendor, uh, on the partner, uh, and so on. Uh, but with, with asking, you, you have the chance to hear it, especially, if, especially from, uh, from young managers, who are not aware of all the consequences that might happen uh, with such exposure. But that will give you a much better insight of uh, the prospect readiness and the, the expect, expected uh, offer. Is that is simply too low or is, if you are simply too far away, uh, you might decide to, you know, to avoid any, any, any follow-ups because uh, the follow-ups will take time and it consume a lot of energy and uh, create uh, expectations that uh, will not uh, be realized. So qualification is extremely important. The other part is empathy. Um, well, <laughs> there's a whole notion that the salesman is a typical guy that, you know, walks around with uh, whatever is available and sends it from door to door to door. This is a typical, you know, uh, salesman. But uh, nowadays, um, especially in, in, in the space that we are all, all working in, this is not possible. So the area in which Emoto is, uh, it is a software for, for the connected mobility and for, especially for insurance industry, is a very complex one and very specific. So in order to, uh, to sell effectively, you first of all have, have to understand the position of the other side. Uh, he, you know, his level of understanding of the topic, uh, his needs, what is the size of the market, what is, uh, what is the company, uh, company's penetration on the market, what are the average prices, and so on and so forth. Again, a lot of, a lot of questions. And uh, I saw a lot, of, a lot of people selling by simply talking, actually, without listening too much from the other side. And, uh, this proved to be not so successful because uh, kind of there is a there was a this is a bit you know side stream uh, in the history of arts in the, in the medieval times uh, there was a school that, that was called horror uh, vacui in Latin meaning uh, the uh, the fright of the empty space. So in order to fulfill the fright of that empty space that we, you know, on the business meetings, we, we fear that in silence, you know, something is probably wrong. Uh, but it doesn't have to be so. So uh, the one that is, if you're in, in a sales position and you should not, you know, necessarily fill that void with, you know, talking all the time, because this prevents the other side to reflect, to, to, to tell something and uh, simply uh, the, whoever is leading, and that should be the one who is selling, uh, is not preparing the, the, uh, the atmosphere for the other side to reflect on, on, on what you said. So the empathy understanding of the other side, which is mainly listening uh, through following a certain structure is extremely important for for the successful sales at least for me uh, again um, 
soft skills and combined with uh, something more structured is uh, what we call the structure. Uh, uh, so usually sales teams and generally teams for business development kind of sometimes act as, uh, as kids playing football. So I guess you all, all saw the, the kids playing football. Where's the ball? All the team is around the ball. So everyone is moving with the ball. You know, there are empty spaces all around, but you know, no one's there. There's no one to kick the ball. So this happens a lot uh, with sales. So if, if there is something that is allegedly big uh, uh, as an opportunity, uh, everyone started to be concentrated about that prospect and forget about er everything else. And uh, probably through, through this, a lot of other opportunities are missed. So all the sales should, f should follow a certain structure for uh, each and every prospect, but uh, looking at the portfolio of, uh, of the potential leads and how the sales process is led uh, down the, you, we can, you can call it funnel. So there are various tools nowadays to, to follow your structure. We, we use the pipe, pipe drive. I don't know if anyone from your side is familiar with it. So you define the stages in a sales process and follow the stages, knowing which stage is important. So from, we start from the leading to the closure. So everything is between are the stages so that you, from, you know, from the general, um, just looking at the sheet or, or, or a single screen, you know, where are the opportunities and what should you concentrate on and uh, have the follow-ups uh, based on, on that structure. So that even though uh, there are very, in sales there are various soft skills like communication, the empathy and so on, the structure is extremely important for the successful sales. Yeah, uh, respect. Uh, <clears throat> As a company, we yeah we originated here in Croatia, but uh, the thing is that within the insurance industry, uh, the companies that are present here, which are subsidiaries of the larger companies like Allianz, General, you all know them, actually do not have the budget or cannot sign any uh, any invoice that is larger than a couple of hundred euros, uh, and uh, mainly all the initiatives that are so important uh, should be taken to to the headquarters so the decision about the uh, projects in croatia uh, are taking place in rome uh, in München, elsewhere who knows where uh, so from from day one we had we had to you know look over over the fence so to say we didn't start uh, locally and then expanded, so we couldn't do that. We had to start from the very beginning uh, abroad. And uh, when jumping abroad, you kind of uh, starting from the position company in Central Europe, you know, that shares certain <laughs> certain values and understanding of how the business is done. And then you start to face other cultures. Uh, I will not go into details but you might be aware of some things like uh, Chinese and the Koreans the kind of uh, act on the master and slave paradigm <laughs> more than you know partnership and vendor and, and, and client uh, we had a couple of calls with Japan and that is special case whoever worked with the Japanese uh, this is a you know different planet on which, uh, for instance, you have a call with them with no video, and you keep talking, talking, and there is nothing, you know, coming back, and suddenly you're you're not true, uh, you're not sure if they are still connected or not. Uh, guys, are you there? And, you know, do you have any feedback, questions, whatever? Yes, you may continue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, literally, and uh, if you have face face to face presentation. Uh, they say that you should uh, first, you know, bow, then not to wave too much because that is not very polite. So you should stand like this, like a soldier in front of them. Should not at any time 
turn back to them, present, you know, showing something on the screen. No, you know, no, it, no, it's hard. It was like this, like a robot. And uh, usually, after you have a couple of calls, you have follow-ups. Okay, guys, well, first, first after the presentation, you want to know uh, how that resonates. You know, how to feel about it. But that doesn't happen. You know, they say, "Thank you. We'll call you back." And you kind of conclude, okay, this won't happen, nothing. Uh, this is done, you know, you drag this to, to trash. And then they do come back after three, four months, you know, with a very structured email consisting of, you know, a couple of pages, a lot of questions. Whoa, where, where did this happen? So it's a total different, uh, different game. Mm, you know, this is... This is mainly Asia, but uh, there are different things in Latin America where we operate. Uh, even in Europe, you might expect different thing, things. For instance, uh, our colleague who lives in, who, who, who graduated in Austria and lives for the last 13 years, had a meeting in Switzerland with, uh, with a guy from the German-speaking uh, county. And uh, in the meeting, he had a translation guy. Because he didn't want to listen to, you know, foreign accent, probably, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, the colleague is speaking uh, quite well. He lives uh, in Austria for the last 13, 14 years. No, but there's a, you know, translation guy. So there are so many things that you have to be aware of uh, once you go uh, international. And uh, cannot take, you know, assumptions that, that you gather locally um, and take it for, for granted. Okay, so... We're coming to, to, to closing. Uh, so, in sales, there, there is a saying um, ABC always be closing, like you should always, you know, sell and with, uh, with every call, with every contact, with, you know, every email. But nowadays, it doesn't function quite well as it, as it functioned uh, probably 50, 50 years ago. So instead of being always uh, closing, you should always pay attention and follow the structure and say, you know, uh, have in mind things that, that I mentioned. Because uh, uh, nowadays it's not about uh, the information, it's not about your availability, you know, it is omnipresent, so to say. It's about being extremely competent, it's about listening and knowing, you know, what the other side has, has to say, if the other side is ready or not, should you wait, uh, should you be introduced to someone else, some other stakeholder that you should present to convince, go there. So pushing too much is uh, actually something that works against uh, successful sales. So don't be always closing, be always near, talking, listening, uh, empathizing with the prospect but not uh, you know, not being too pushy and the last one but not the least if the client is not right it doesn't have money it uh, wants to have you know huge discounts uh, whatever it may take just say no avoid it it's better to avoid it just, you know forget about so-called sunk cost you invested two three months in talks but this will create a lot of trouble later in development, uh, later in account management, in everything. So if this is the this is the understanding of the position with the client, simply say no and you know forget forget about it. And uh, I think that's it. Thanks. So we'll take questions now, and then we'll start the panel. So, what is the line between just say no and empathy? Well, there's a line in profitability, probably. So, <laughs> if this is you know a huge reference uh, for you, that you are willing to invest for for the sake of onboarding other clients, uh, or do you see other values that are not direct uh, revenues from this customer, this is pro probably the red line that should not not be crossed. So, it would be some kind of value or KPI that we should move on. Yeah, of course. Go on. Uh, 
uh, really due to the bio personas, I'm sure you do the wisdom, you do one way or another. Yeah. Um, in your experience, is it better to like uh, create as specific as possible bio persona types and then target these specific types of potential clients? Do you yeah. have some tips about that? Yeah, this is a good question. So. Mm, yeah, we use personas because we identified who is the main per persona for, for our product. In, this is extremely specific so because those are probably the chief information or officer or chief digital officer in the insurance industries. You know, you, since this is very niche, you, you have to know them you know, by name, not you know, as a per persona. Uh, uh, but still, mm, uh, even though he's the main persona, uh, we have learned that uh, the same projects in various companies are differently structured. So in some companies, uh, <coughs> the, the main stakeholder holder for, the, uh, uh, for the project are sitting in the actuarial department. So you're probably not uh, acquainted with the insurance industry. Those are the mathematicians that calculate the risk, risk and so on. In some others, those are the guys uh, in, in marketing and sales, probably chief marketing officer. Mm -hmm. And the goals of each of those is very different. So uh, for the project, if you have this you know, platform as a service, software as a service, you should definitely uh, think about the persona, but not being too religious about it. But that, that should be reflected in the material, in the messages, in the tone. On the website and wording and value prop and everything. So this is part of the tactics when you have uh, the strategy with the personas. This is part of the tactical approach. You're welcome. Yeah. So do you have some good advice uh, regarding the resources for um, researching about other? cultures and how do they do business, what to think about if you're having your first meeting with somebody I don't know, from a specific country in Asia, where you can quickly look up how do they do business, how do they uh, like to communicate over the Skype or whatever. Do you have some good advice? Did you find some good resource for those kind of things? Yeah, there are a lot of websites that, that kind of present such such things, including the names, which, which can be extremely confusing. Uh, because you don't know which is which and how you, you should call it. Uh, so you should put dear or simply hi. Uh, I don't know, with Asians probably it's always dear, you know, very, you know, polite and with the distance. And with Americans, you should, uh, hey, you know, how are you? Yeah, directly, very directly. So mm, <laughs> it's difficult to tell. Yeah, of course, there are. Various books and, uh, and uh, numerous uh, pages that are, that, that are there, but uh, you have to experience things to know what to look for. Uh, I don't know. In in Iceland, they don't have the proper family names at all. So they have like uh, uh, so. Actually, there is no such thing as family name. They have a mm, first name. Bjork, so to say, and then the, the the next part is the name of the father, where ending with ending son or daughter, and that's it. So the next generation does not bear the same you know thing. So you should never call it Miss and then family name because this is very wrong. So how to know this? <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, the, the Asian guys, probably uh, mostly f the Chinese and, and those guys uh, that are communicating with uh, Western companies, usually uh, give them the, give themselves uh, a certain nickname, which resonates, you know, like they're from West. So I'm communicating at the moment with a guy that I call Ted. And I cannot recall what is his name, but something in Japanese, I don't know. Yeah, but he, uh, he introduced himself as Ted. Right? Yeah, yeah, and he, and he said, you know, best regards, Ted. And in, uh, in the Philippines, 
they kind of had a, uh, they were under the US and after and before that under Spanish. They kind of have mixed, you know, uh, Spanish first name and then Johnson or something as a family name. And, but they put in between the nickname and uh, they have the, it's not just, you know, nickname when you are familiar with him. No, they have emails with the nickname. You know, nickname at you know the company. This is official, you know, email. So it gets some time to to understand this. <laughs> so this is interesting. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, we'll start our panel now then. Thanks so, for the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Again. Okay, so I'm Steve, you guys know me from PM Zagreb. And we have two other panelists joining us, so please come and join us. Ivana is one of them. Tell us about yourself, Ivana. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I see. And Ines, where are you? I saw you. Yeah. So where, what company are you with and what do you um, do? Okay, so I'm currently at Heisen Informatica, which is a partner company for Salesforce. Uh, my current position is Salesforce Consultant which is basically a project uh, management um, position. And we implement or we um, help clients implement and uh, um, consult them around the entire CRM solution. Salesforce is a CRM solution, uh, whoever doesn't know about it. Um, so yeah, basically project management position. And CRM is? CRM is, uh, oh sorry, uh, customer relationship management. It's a platform where you have all the data uh, about whoever your customer is. So I'm Ines. Wow, a little louder. <laughs> okay, so I'm working at Five as a project manager right now. Uh, previously, I was a software engineer for about six years. And I'm working mostly with US clients or business analysts from other companies. And uh, while I was working at my first company, it was also an offshore office for an American company called Clarity Consulting. So we also worked with their project managers there. So it's mostly like US. Everyone, everyone's worked with the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my previous my previous job was uh, uh, Bella. We were made our own hardware, and it was targeted eighty percent at U.S. So it was mostly you know. Uh, okay. So one slide that really resonated with me was the respect one. I always recommend if you if you're like a contractor, you're considered taking on a client. You you have to respect the person you're working with. Otherwise, you're not going to do your best job. So are there some situations where you've turned someone down because of you didn't respect them or maybe you maybe handled the project differently because you didn't necessarily respect them? Anyone, hmm. anyone can jump in. Well, or anyone from the audience too. Uh, I don't, it's hard to say what, what exactly, is, is this the case that you mentioned or is this something else? Mm -hmm. So. There are no many companies uh, in this space, and uh, we face a fierce competition with, with guys from UK, US, and so on. So there is a espionage going between us. Uh huh. Yeah. So you're a spy. Is what you're yeah. In a way. <laughs> uh, so sometimes uh, I'm not sure if this is a client or just a, you know someone who is uh, trying to pick up and uh, uh -huh. learn about our. Uh, our take, uh, because all of us have diff a bit slightly different takes and slightly different angles, and all of us have, have their our own pricing, of course. So uh, I kind of have a right, right right at the moment. I have actually two. I don't know how to call them prospects or not leads or leads, something. Uh, but actually I don't know if those are leads or not. Uh, that I'm kind of on hot call relationship because uh, I don't know if I can trust them or not and uh, just when, with one of those I kind of ended with uh, okay pay the pilot guys and we'll continue from there so 
at least they'll give us 40, 50 K to, to, to start something. And if they want to, to copy, we'll have something out of it. Cool. Um, with us, it's simply, um, uh, we have these stages that we go through. So when a lead is uh, in just like the discovery stage, uh, we kind of have to, um, it's, it's our job to really realize what their pain and goals are. And so usually the budget is the main problem. And so if we kind of realize right there in that stage that they probably, the solution is going to be too expensive for them, we kind of decline it right there. So it's that, that part is where we say no, um, even though they sometimes would like to see more or see a demo or like have more info, we kind of just uh, stop it right there. So. Um, because it, it just based on our experience where we would invest our time and resources and it just um, doesn't make sense. Yeah, so we kind of just stop it there when we kind of um, detect that budget's going to be a major problem. How often does it get past that stage and then you'll choose to not work with them for some other reason? So far, uh, I believe we did not have any... any um, problems like that we kind of uh, we kind of we adapt to <laughs> whatever whatever the situation might be so sometimes um, we invest a lot of time and just like uh, we need to understand their needs like on a really good level and we need to understand their uh, business as well as they do and their processes so um, we currently have a situation where, where they wanted to uh, say no and kind of give up on the solution and go with the competition, we kind of realize there's a new solution for them, the entire different product, sort of speaking, and uh, so we kind of just benefit, like... Uh, just pivot them to yeah, the product. Yeah, so we kind of, it went a different direction. So, but it could have been like if we didn't uh, invest time in realizing what their, um, what their needs actually are, and that we have, we have a specific kind of, kind of, or like, it, it is a more expensive product, but it is specific for their, business uh they would turn us down and like go with the competition or if if even i i don't believe competition even offers anything like that so um it wasn't it wasn't no on our end but we kind of just uh turned them turned into, it into, a yes. <laughs> into a yes in our end yeah how many people uh are involved in the the learning phase when you when bringing on new clients are you involved at your company in learning about what the client needs yeah. Minas, any cases where you rejected clients rejected for respect, clients. respect reasons or something like well, that? Well, since I'm not, um, I mean, long in a project management role, but uh, we had some like discussions over uh, some key product decisions. Mm -hmm. And when you get in situation when you have to turn down some requirements or some part of project that you don't think that it should work like that, like that they imagined. So you really need to have good arguments and you have to be very objective. And then you propose solution that kind of fits their needs, but you need to understand what they want because sometimes they don't understand what they want and they have like some wrong vision how the products should look like. And then if you get to know the real purpose, why they want to do it, you can maybe suggest them an uh, alternative solution, which works for you in a technical way. Yeah, so one of the, the keys to road mapping is you should be putting problems that you'll solve on your roadmap rather than solutions, because this gives you flexibility to adjust to the needs. Uh, maybe you can eliminate a problem through some other system, maybe through like customer education, and you don't even have to build features in order to do that. So that's maybe kind of down the same path there. Yeah, it's always difficult to turn the lead down. Yeah. Because you, you invest a lot of time, you see your opportunity there, uh, but eventually you learn that uh, there's, there's no opportunity for you or um, uh, simply the expectations are too far apart. Okay, any other questions? So, what is the biggest difference between international clients and working with them in opposed to local clients? Like the pros and cons for you? 
I'll say uh, for local clients, sorry to jump in, it's really easy to just drive to their office or grab a coffee, something like that. With international uh, clients, depending on where they are, you might have time zone differences. Um, but that being said, I think, you know, if you're focused on your communication, then I'll, I'll disagree with our, our guest here. I don't think you should have to go and meet them in person if you have really worked on your communication. Hopefully you can like close that gap down because for me, meetings are a waste of time. They're just terrible and you shouldn't ever have meetings, but you know, <laughs> I'll, dis I'll disagree with you strongly. Okay, I'll disagree right? with I you. I hate meetings. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, the position that we have with uh, some of our clients is such that uh, we are a company of, I don't know, 25 to 30 people at the moment. And we work with uh, Porsche Leasing that sells almost a million cars annually in Europe only. So they have, I don't know, a few tens of thousands of people employed and we are just, you know, a, a dot somewhere down there in, in, in the Balkans probably. Uh, if they know where the Balkans is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. if they care. Uh, so uh, this is a different position. Uh, you know, we are, uh, first of all, you have to acknowledge that uh, we are in a country that is not the sexiest for the technology, first of all. Second of all, uh, we don't have, unfortunately, the brand that Salesforce does. So it's really difficult to, you know, to get attention of, of, of some people. And in your communication, I didn't mention this, but for instance, guys from Porsche, of course, they have huge limitations in terms of a firewall and such things. Uh, they now, after we insisted, they opened the only available options for the teleconference because, you know, Skype, WebEx, no, Link, no, nothing. You can simply have face-to-face -face meetings, phone calls, that's it. So their IT policy is so strict that it just, it just inhibits And you know, the... typically other companies have the policy in which only the single tool is allowed. Yeah. So either you use this or you don't use that. Yeah, I would have to jump in. Um, as I said, um, we're a partner company uh, for Salesforce. And whenever we close a client, um, we actually have our uh, Salesforce representative come here and meet the client, whoever, whether they're in this part of region, because we uh, represent the entire region. So they actually take time and effort to, to, to make uh, in meetings in person, because uh, they believe it really brings, you know, a, a better value to the entire um, project. So. We kind of do the same thing if if they're not here, if they're a different country or far away, we always do video calls just because it's more personal that way. Um, but whenever we can, we also try to, to, to do the, the meetings in person uh, just because it's an extra value and kind of shows that we care more or, or, or at least have like one of the first meetings in person and then the rest of them uh, video calls, if not calls, whether it's Skype or any kind of uh, different kind of like normal uh, phone calls because uh, I don't know it's more it's always more personal it's extra value than just sending emails back and forth so so I think it shows a lot that uh, they have representatives covering this part of Europe and whenever um, I mean they close a lot of clients but whenever they do they actually come here and meet the entire team uh, the entire company and stuff like that so and they always invite us because we're a partner company are so. they flying out from SF or are they like do yeah, they yeah, have yeah. someone they have, from it's the Dublin okay. yeah yeah they have uh, they have the headquarters in Dublin okay. and I think in Budapest as well but mostly from Dublin okay. so it's not far away but it is also so it depends on how you look at it but they actually take time and effort take to time. come and yeah I'm not saying if it's possible and if it's not if it's not yeah. like costing no, a lot no. then it's always better to actually do it especially if it's uh if it's within the region it's I would say it's always better to, so, to do it I'm not saying never meet the client I'm not saying that I'm saying don't have repeating meetings don't go to meetings just for the sake of having yeah, meetings no, yeah. learn how to communicate better so that you don't have to have meetings how often are you uh, visiting your clients? You've been you've been PMing for just a short time now, yeah. right? 
Yeah. So have you met them all face to face? Maybe was the first question. Uh, no, I haven't met them face to face because project is at that stage where they have all stuff laid out and they don't have. I believe they don't have any particular reason to come here because everything is like they already hierarchy set up and things that are like. There have already been face to face yeah. meetings. And, but I think that uh, probably in initial stage or if you are like having the first team in one country, then you have to go there, you have to meet people and especially in sales, I agree that meetings are uh, more appreciated than maybe in development and project management because things are, I would say, more straightforward or you don't need to feel how your people think and react because yeah, the things are already laid out, so you just need to write some stuff and the team can work on something. So I would say it's different. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <clears throat> uh, our meetings or even calls, actually, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it, you know, <laughs> sales or communication. Uh, in order to have a successful sales, you have to build for such projects that we, we want to push, and those are the projects which are usually nowadays between 100 to 100K a year. So you definitely have to build a relationship with, with someone. So you have to have someone that you can pick up the phone and call. And trust. And, and trust and find things, find, you know, recognize if he's your advocate or he's an evangelist or whoever. And with such a relationship, you can learn a lot more and, you know, avoid unnecessarily internal meetings. So how should we structure this? So is this relevant or not? Should we push this or not? You know, they, you know, those guys can simply tell you, no, no, don't go there. And if, if they like you, and this usually is the case with someone that you <laughs> connect with, they, they will say, uh, no, you know, take the advice, uh, don't go there, don't go this, you know, be be aware of these guys and just for you, you know, the main competitor is this and that. So when you say the main competitor is, I don't know, the name of the company, you say, ah, okay. I have much better insight, but now I, I know what I have to do for to, to win this. To win this out. Uh, is anyone involved with uh, doing competitor research at their companies, anything like that? Okay, other questions? Okay, so um, you mentioned that you've been having problems, of course, uh, with international clients, uh, with the fact that you're from Croatia, like IT company from Croatia. Yep. What is Where is Croatia? Yeah. Never even heard so of that country. So you've been problems with uh, even local, really close company, uh, countries like Austria, that they've been just treating us like any other, you know, yep. Asian develop two dollars in our developers, yes. you know, and treating us in a way where they just plan to use our work and then it, it, it was really bad. So did you find some good ways to, I don't know, to explain, to, to show to people uh, that we have potential, that maybe show some uh, success uh, scenarios, some good cases from Croatia. Do you have some advice on that field? How to persuade, how to show the client that actually somebody, an IT company from Croatia can provide yeah. really good quality for their Western market? Yeah, I actually I do, uh, especially for Austria and Germany. So my first advice is to find something, someone with very good German. You should not speak English with them at all. So go there with the guy there that is good in German, of course that knows what, uh, what he's talking about, and try to pitch with, with him, not, not in English, because English, you know, kind of works, but eventually, you know, puts you, puts you in a, in, a, in a difficult position. Because, uh, yeah, uh, the colleague that is, uh, uh, who is living in, in Vienna, uh, was with Goriat, who was also here on a meeting with, I don't know, Allianz, I think, in Germany. And the, the meeting started in, in English for the first 10 minutes. And then they simply switched, since they learned that the guy is speaking German, they switched to, to German. 
and never turn you know back to to English. I mean, those are C level guys. They they for sure speak English quite well, and they know that the other guy in the team, you know, in our team, does not speak German at all. But still, they don't fucking care. You know, if you want to sell in Germany, speak German. So this is this is one of the things. Uh, you know, it's. You know, it's in the chicken and an egg. So you say uh, show the references, but how do you, you know how how to build the first reference? Because they will they will ask, do you have the reference in Austria? And I will say, uh, what is the bloody difference you I have in the U.S.? No, 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 no. This is this different story. Do you have in Austria? And they say no. Okay, then no. So um, it's yeah, it's much easier to when, when once we have a reference. Uh, mm, but uh, it's always good to show competence uh, and to be we kind of learned that we have to be uh, comparing to, to to the local competitors you know twice as good not only in terms of the pricing but in terms of what we offer what is our knowledge how well we prepared for the meeting uh, we just had a pitch uh, for Volkswagen uh, and this is you know huge opportunity for the company and we prepared like for three weeks and uh, they were like Whoa, what happened here so all of the others you know had the company presentation and a couple of things what we you could, we could do you had a whole concept you know, hundred slides uh, all the design and everything it can do, go down the drain but this is actually the only way so you you know what Yoda says you either do or you don't do there's no try so, try with it. <laughs> Any other insight into that? How to break into a different culture, how to convince another culture to give you the respect that you hopefully deserve? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I would say uh, have an inside man or woman. I think that for me, makes my job easier if I'm going to try to sell to the U.S. I'm going to be like, hey, I'm from the U.S., what's up? <laughs> um, and I think really understanding the culture. Um, there's, a, uh, there's an article by Harvard Business Review. It's called Getting to We See, uh, See, Ya, We, Hi, and Da. Getting to see, ya, we, hi, and da. And it's, um, they, they look at um, different cultures and graph them on two, two axes. One being um, emotion, how much emotion you show during negotiation. And the other is how much confrontation there is. Uh, so in American business, there's a lot of energy and you won't necessarily see that in other cultures. And you might see a lot of fighting, a lot of, you know, telling you like, no, 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 we're not going to do it this way. And that doesn't mean they don't like you or they think that you're wrong. They want you to fight back. And so really understanding like how far you can push uh, with your particular counterpart, I think mm -hmm. is really important to the, to the negotiating process, whether you're negotiating a sales contract or, you know, a new feature. So. Totally agree. I know. <clears throat> in a classic Japanese board, there are five people involved, or I, I almost said five men, but this is usually true. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, gross. <laughs> and uh, all the important decisions should be made 5-0. Uh, so there are no you know, decisions taken 3-2. to two. I'm against and uh, you, you are for it and let's, let's do it. No, everyone should be convinced and uh, this is the right decision, and this is uh, what everyone from the board will take with them and then uh, and transfer to, to, to the organization. On some other boards, there are members that are simply, you know, naysayers, challengers, who, you know, simply challenge all the things. And that is their explicit role, yes. is to vote, try yes. to convince everyone They're else. They are paid to be, you know, bitch. <laughs> Like amongst the local clients, and they have a uh, person from Nababa <laughs> who always whose role in the meetings is 
this is too expensive, this is too expensive. And um, yeah, pr procurement. This is yeah, yeah, procurement. So they usually have a, a person that always challenges the price. Yeah. You know, in, in huge uh, financial institutions, there is a you know, division of procurement. It kind of has hundreds of questions, you know, challenge every single letter, so on, but you have to live with it. And there are chief uh, security officers, chief this, chief that, you know, whatever there is, they have chief, you know, in the company. Well, yeah. I, I, was, yeah. I mean, depending on the size of the company, though, that those roles exist for a reason, and you you really do need to have your project set up in a way that you speak to all those concerns, because any one of them can put a stop to it. So yes, and that that again goes into the preparedness. So um, yeah, it's, it's just know your client, know your enemy, know thy enemy. Yeah, yeah. sometimes, as I said, we are uh, you know in two different worlds. So when we started to work with AIG, the you know you have to fill this questionnaire. For security, the question consists of I don't know, 355 questions. Uh, you simply cannot understand what are, what are they asking. You know, what is the reason? Uh, actually, what should I answer here? <laughs> if you you know, if you should, you, you're trying to be nice, but actually you don't know what, what is the right answer. It's very difficult. Yeah, I worked for one company, and uh, one of our clients got audited, and because they were audited we as a vendor had to answer, you know, I don't know, three yeah. forms of worth of questions just to show that we were treating their data correctly. And of course, now there's the new uh, European laws about personal GDPR. identifying, GDPR. yeah, G what is it called, GD GDPR. GDPR. Yeah, so. yeah. And there are a lot of, uh, at least for us, uh, in the last couple of months, a lot of uh, initiatives run by <coughs> consultants, you know, you uh, talk with them for months and you don't know who is the client. So this is stuff also. And you know, those guys usually know what to ask and you know, how to structure things. One final question. Cross Thank you. Scenario. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we can have um, So how, uh, let's everyone put your hand up. Everyone put your hand in the air. And put your hand down if you don't work with international clients, if you don't work with international clients. So almost everyone, great. Uh, well, thank you for our time, that's it. And, uh, is anyone currently hiring right now? Is anyone's company currently hiring? So a couple people, so if you want a new job or you just wanna <laughs> try to like up your salary, those are the people. <laughs> To talk to. Uh, thank you again to our panelists, and we'll see you uh, next year with some sort of wonderful talk, I'm sure. So, thanks again. Thank